Hey everyone, and welcome back to Reading with Raptors. If you are watching this at the usual Tuesday morning time, you'll probably notice that this video is actually pre-recorded this week. We have a um, very important schedule conflict. I'm actually pre-recording this video and kind of taking advantage of the fact that it's pre-recorded to bring in another bird that I haven't introduced here on Reading with Raptors yet, um, since she really isn't typically in this kind of setting as much, hasn't really seen as many things like books moving, things like that. Um, so this is a one of our resident barred owls who we call Strix for reasons that we'll actually talk about as we get into our book here. Um, and since she she isn't as experienced with this kind of program and video and things, I thought that doing a pre-recorded video with her would be the best way to kind of introduce her to all of this. So before we started recording here, I actually had the camera pulled up and was handing her pieces of food, practicing kind of opening and closing the book and making sure that she gets lots of pieces of rat for standing here and looking around um, and otherwise just showing that she's not particularly concerned about the big screen with an owl on it that we're looking at right now. Um, so this all seems to be going really, really well. I'm really excited. So hopefully we will see more of this barred owl in the future in our live videos. But again, for today, since we're not able to do a video live, I figured this would be a great opportunity to introduce her for Reading with Raptors. Uh, as always, though, we will have somebody kind of monitoring the comments as this is posted, and I know I'll be keeping an eye on them as well. So definitely feel free if you're watching this on Tuesday morning, um, definitely go ahead and post comments as we go, and we'll be sure to respond to them. It just won't be here in the video. So today, um, since we have our barred owl here, a few things about her. Um, so this is actually a 12-year-old barred owl. They really get the kind of adult colorations pretty quickly. So she's looked pretty much the same as when she was brought in as a first year bird. So this barred owl is about 12 years old this year. And she was actually brought in after some sort of collision that actually caused her to lose functioning of a very important part of her right eye. It is actually a third eyelid that all raptors have um, called the nictitating membrane. So this is actually common across kind of the animal kingdom. There are a lot of different kinds of animals that have this third eyelid. Unfortunately, us humans do not. We just have our top eyelids and our bottom eyelids. But a lot of animals, including birds, have a third eyelid, that nictitating membrane that comes from the corner of their eyes and kind of goes outwards like this. Kind of works a little bit like windshield wipers. It acts as a pair of built-in safety goggles. So they're able to kind of close those third eyelids and still see through them somewhat. So you'll often see, especially raptors, closing that third eyelid when they're kind of leaning in to grab onto a piece of food, um, maybe lean in to make sure that a mouse they have captured is fully deceased before they eat it, that kind of thing. So they're protecting their very precious eyeballs um, from any damage while they're kind of leaning in, maybe doing something that might potentially damage them. So really important um, and means that her right eye really can't see as well as she would need to. There was kind of a, a lot of trauma in that eye um, that was not really able to be fully repaired. So because she doesn't have the proper vision and functioning in that eye, that is why this bird lives with us at the Raptor Center and has for most of her life. You can see the excellent camouflage that she has, those kind of nice striped feathers, the bars that give the barred owl their name. Excellent for blending in, um, especially here in kind of the whole eastern half of the United States and up into Canada. You'll usually see them in areas with nice kind of trees, um, the kind of general Strix genus or kind of family group of owls is often called the wood owls. So you'll see them generally in areas that are kind of nice, lightly or even densely wooded areas. A lot of times we can actually see them here in the cities or in the suburbs in kind of those wood lots or kind of drainage area, uh, pond type areas where you have lots of trees, uh, maybe some bushes, maybe a little bit of ground cover. And especially if there's a little bit of water, a lot of times ponds and lakes and streams will have barred owls nearby. Unlike a lot of owls, they will actually go down and you can see her, her feet definitely have feathers but are not really densely feathered because oftentimes barred owls will actually be on the edges of those streams and ponds looking around and fishing for things like minnows, crayfish, amphibians like frogs or salamanders. Um, I know I actually have a group of barred owls that uh, has nested near where I live and I will find little crayfish claws. So definitely keep an eye out for them. 
tricky to spot, but especially around kind of as you get further into the nighttime, you might be able to hear them. They make the really classic kind of who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Um, so you can often hear them. I've been hearing them kind of around sunset, sunrise, but oftentimes they're the most active in the middle of the night. So you can keep an ear out for those. With all of that being said, a little bit of background on the barred owl. Let's actually take a look. I found a book that will probably end up being a multi-part one, but I found this one and the illustrations inside were wonderful. So this is the Book of North American Owls. This is by Helen Roney Sattler, illustrated by Jean Day Zallinger. Um, and this one has a lot of really good kind of dense information about owls. So we're not going to get through uh, most of it. Kind of the whole back half of it is actually information about individual owl species, um, which isn't super fun to read out loud. So we won't do most of those, but I will definitely read the barred owl entry on that one. But we'll probably read the first half of the kind of uh, extra information here at the front of the book. And in a future week, we will revisit maybe with another kind of owl and read more about it. But you'll see once you look at the illustrations, there are a lot of really great kind of scientific illustrations as we go. So we're going to take a look, but I'm going to quick, as I raise this book up, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that this bird gets a piece of food for seeing this book. Since this is something that's kind of new to her, I want to make sure that she's getting lots of pieces of food, lots of reinforcement for standing pretty comfortably, um, looking around, really not showing too many signs of being kind of worried about book moving around, me talking, the big camera here. I want to make sure that this is a really positive experience for her. So that way, it's really comfortable for her to do it again in the future, which is great. We're multitasking. We're recording and we're training as well. So thank you all for letting me do this today. So... Without further ado, this is the Book of North American Owls. And the first section here, this is a great illustration of a barn owl with two children kind of walking into an actual barn where it is. This is, what is an owl? The spring before I started school, my younger brother and I discovered that the barn was a perfect place to play on windy days when it was too cold to play outside. We were protected from the wind, and the hay kept the temperature warmer inside than out. The barn was also a perfect roosting place for the big barn owl that perched on its nest box high above our heads. Even though the owl seemed half as tall as we were, we weren't afraid of it. I was fascinated by its heart-shaped face and by the way it watched our every move with its big eyes, turning its head from side to side. But Dad didn't like the owl in his barn. He said it brought mites and that its droppings and pellets made a mess and spoiled the hay. He tried, with little success, to discourage us from playing out there. He said it wasn't safe. Dad may have been afraid the owl would attack us during nesting season. Owls can be quite belligerent when protecting their nests. Eventually, Dad tore the nest box down and the owl found another suitable nesting place nearby. I still heard its familiar calls just after dusk. Many people don't like owls because they are raptors, birds of prey that catch other animals for food. At one time, farmers shot every owl they saw because owls sometimes killed chickens and geese. Most people, however, are as fascinated by and respectful of owls as I am. Pictures and stories show us that people have, we'll finish up on the next page, but here's those kids in the barn again with that barn owl. And here is a barn owl with a mouse. Kind of confusing with barn owls and barred owls, kind of confusing names. But we're about to talk about some other names for these owls that might be a little bit less confusing. People have always been captivated by these unusual birds throughout history. Many ancient peoples believed that owls were spirits and had magic powers and often worshipped or feared the birds. Pictures of owls were drawn on the walls of caves 18,000 years ago by ancient Europeans and by prehistoric Native Americans in Tennessee. 
Today, the owl is considered a symbol of wisdom, maybe because of its large staring eyes, or perhaps because it usually sits quietly, observing everything that goes on without making a sound. There are a lot of things to admire about owls. If it were not for owls, there would be much less food for humans to eat. Owls destroy enormous numbers of pests, such as rodents and insects that eat crops and damage grain. They are the world's greatest mousers and are the cheapest and most efficient natural controllers of rodent populations available. They cost nothing. Owls deserve the strict protections they now get. Until recently, no one knew very much about owls. Owls are seldom seen and had not been well studied because of the difficulty in observing them. Most owls are nocturnal birds. They hunt at night and roost during the day, and many live in remote forested habitats. When people finally began to understand the value of owls, laws were passed to protect these birds and funds provided to pay scientists to study them. Most of what we know about owls has been learned in the last 15 years or so. Owls come in all sizes and shapes. They live throughout the world on every continent except Antarctica and are found in every kind of habitat from cold Arctic tundra to hot tropical forests and from arid prairies to wet marshlands. Scientists call all soft plumaged, short tailed, big headed birds of prey with flat facial discs and large forward facing eyes, owls. The word owl comes from the old English word ul, meaning to howl, and refers to the bird's distinctive calls. Scientists divide all living things into different groups or orders. The order of owls is strigiformes from strigis, the name of a Greek owl. There are two families or kinds of strigiformes. Most, bird, most owls belong to the Strigidae family, the typical owls. They range in length from the top of the head to the tip of the tail from five to 33 inches. The smallest weighs about as much as a mockingbird, one to 1.4 ounces. The largest weighs as much as a black vulture, that's three and a half to four and a half pounds. There are 130 species of Strigidae. 21 of them live in North America. The other family is called the Titanidae or barn owls. The name Titanidae comes from the Greek word tuto, meaning night owl, which fits barn owls very well because they hunt only at night. They are rarely seen in the daytime except when roosting in a barn. Barn owls are different from other owls in several ways. Their facial discs are heart-shaped their eyes are smaller than those of typical owls, and their ear openings are ovals instead of slits. Their legs are longer than those of Strigidae, and a barn owl's second toe is the same length as its first toe. Their high-pitched call is different too. Barn owls don't hoot like most typical owls. There are 12 kinds or species of Titanidae, but only one lives in North America. A closer view of these. I really like how they arrange them on these branches, kind of like a family tree, if you'll pardon the pun. Here's one tree with just the barn owls on it. This is the Titanidae branch of the Strigiformes, or owls. So these are barn owls. And then here, kind of to scale, are all of the different Strigidae owls, or our typical owls. You can see the barred owl down here compared to uh, the barn owl that we have up over here. You can see great horned owls and great gray owls, snowy owls, even down to our smallest owl, the elf owl. So these are all of the owls that live here in North America, here on this page. Scientists separate families into genera and species, which are given scientific names that are the same throughout the world in every language. The North American barn owl's scientific name is Tito alba. Tito, the genus name, is Greek for night owl, and alba, the species name, is Latin for white. The name tells us it is a white night owl. 
Not everyone agrees on the exact number of species of owls in the world today. The most recent checklist, and this is as of 1995, so this may actually be different now, but as of when this book came out, the most recent checklists name 164. Of these, only 21 live in North America. Owls have been around for a very long time, much longer than humans. They probably became distinct from other birds 70 to 80 million years ago, while dinosaurs were still roaming the earth. The fossil record of owls is one of the longest of all groups of living birds. The owl generally accepted as oldest is Ojigoptinx. There's a pronunciation guide. Here's what it looks like. Ojigoptinx. It was named for Ojigis, the Greek mythical king of Thebes, and the Greek name of an owl, Tinx. It lived in Colorado more than 60 million years ago. We can't be sure what it looked like because it is known only from an ankle and foot, but these parts are very similar to those of the modern burrowing owl. The burrowing owl eats insects and reptiles. Scientists think Ojigoptinx probably also ate insects and reptiles. Fossil evidence suggests its ancestors may have come from Asia. So here's some detail of, this one's an example of the barred owl, or excuse me, the barn owl. So here's what it looks like with feathers, but underneath here are, here's kind of what its head looks like. So you can see how huge that beak actually is. And here's the big flap that covers up the hole for its ear. Here is actually in head of a more typical owl with kind of the rounded facial shape. And here are its ear openings that are asymmetrical. So one of them opens up here and the other one opens down here. This is pretty typical of a lot of our typical owls, especially some of the smaller owls like our boreal owls and saw wet owls. But you'll also see this on the skull of the barred owl like the one that we are seeing right here. Underneath all those fluffy feathers are some very big holes for the ears. Here also is a skeleton of an owl. I won't point out all the different parts, but here is kind of a how, how that skeleton actually looks. So underneath all of those fluffy feathers, birds actually have some very long legs and some very long wings. Their actual bodies with their torso and their pelvis are really quite tiny. A lot of times people ask me about pictures and videos of birds showing off those super long legs, and I always tell them that bird legs are much longer than what it looks like to us. Right now when we look at this barred owl, it looks like there's just these tiny little feet sticking out, but really those legs are super, super long underneath all that fluff. So here's what that actually looks like under there. The earliest known barn owl, Sophiornis, lived in France about 24 million years ago. The largest barn owl, Tito Riveroy, lived in Cuba 30,000 years ago. It was between two and three times the size of barn owls living in Cuba today. Ornamegalonyx, the largest owl that has ever lived, was twice the size of the great horned owl. This 10,000-year-old owl was capable of killing giant sloths and pig-sized rodents, as scientists know from bones found with it in a cave in Cuba. Interesting to think. I, I love reading about the fossil history of different kinds of owls and really types of animals, especially when we're sitting here looking at kind of a modern-day version, thinking about all of the history, all of the different kind of habitats and climate changes and um, thinking about some of the earliest ancestors of owls were living when the dinosaurs lived, a lot of changes since then. I just always think it's so cool to look at these birds and think about the kind of history there. So there's a little section here about perfect predators. It'll talk about some of the adaptations. So I want to read through that part and then we'll save some of the rest of this for some other session. But here's a beautiful picture of a barn owl swooping down to grab a mouse. And we're going to talk about the different kind of ways that these birds have adapted to really be excellent at this job of catching those small rodents. Shortly after sunset, a barn owl awakens and leaves its perch. 
Silently, it patrols the pasture, skimming over the ground just a few feet above the vegetation, looking and listening for small animals. Spotting a meadow mouse, it hovers momentarily, then, with its talons spread, it plunges and lands on the animal, pinning it to the ground. The owl kills the mouse with its beak and swallows it whole. This owl is lucky. It captured food on its first attempt of the night. Scientists show that most owls miss more often than they catch prey. Although owls are superb hunters, the animals they feed on are skillful at escaping. Owls seldom go hungry, however, except in winter, because food is usually plentiful during other seasons and owls are well equipped for catching it. Most owls' legs are covered with feathers. Below these trousers of feathers on each foot are four powerful toes equipped with long, curved, needle-sharp talons. Two of those toes can turn forward and the other two backward, enabling the owl to get a firm grip on its prey. Once grasped, the prey seldom gets loose. A great horned owl's grip may be one of the strongest in nature. It can snap the neck of a groundhog as easily as you can a toothpick. Most owls, however, kill by biting their prey at the base of the skull with sharp hooked beaks. Owls are also well equipped for finding food. With the exception of the short-eared owl, the snowy owl, which lives in the far north where lights are sometimes, where nights are sometimes very short, and the burrowing owl, owls hunt at night where they can see much better in the dark, many times better than humans can. Large eyes collect more light than small eyes and their eyes are huge. The eyes of a 70 ounce snowy owl weigh as much as those of a 200 pound adult person. They take up more space in the owl's head than its thimble sized brain. So here are the diagrams on this one. I just wanted to finish that sentence. So here are these eyes. Here's an idea of what their vision range is like. So here's the head of a barn owl and kind of the lighter yellow is kind of the range of all of their vision, but because their eyes face forward, just like us, they have a range where their vision overlaps. That's what creates that binocular vision or what gives us what we call depth perception, where we can see how far away things are. Here's an owl's eye. You can see they actually become almost kind of bell-shaped or pear-shaped. I like to think of them as looking kind of like light bulbs do, where this, the front of the eye, kind of the part that we can see, the actual kind of iris and pupil of the eye, this is the front part of the eye. This part here, there were, that's kind of like the part of the light bulb that screws into the lamp, right? But the back of the eye is actually bigger than the front of the eye, which really magnifies that light that they get and lets them see in just a little bit of light. Here's a diagram of that nictitating membrane. So this is kind of where the beak would be and it's kind of shutting over the eye this way. Here are the upper and inner eyelids, or upper and lower eyelids, excuse me. And then here is how they're able to adjust their pupil size. So they have tiny little pupils during the daytime when there's lots of light, and then their pupils can get very big and wide to let in more light during the nighttime. Just like if we're ever in a dark room, our pupils, the kind of dark spot in the middle of our eyes, they can expand and get bigger, but then when a bright light is kind of shining into our eyes, they get super, super tiny. So in addition to those giant eyes taking up all of that space, their eyes are placed in the front of its head and spaced far apart. This gives the owl excellent binocular or three-dimensional vision, which allows it to judge accurately distances as well as the size and speed of its prey. A great gray owl is able to spot a mouse 200 yards away. Owls can also change the focus of their eyes rapidly. They can focus on objects both near and far at the same time. This may be why they can fly through tree branches at night and not collide with them. In addition to upper and lower lids, owls have a third translucent eyelid called a nictitating membrane. This membrane keeps the eye moist and may give protection from damage during struggles with prey. 
Tests show that some owls can even distinguish between colors, which I'll add is kind of important because usually for most eyes, and this is true with owls as well, if you're seeing things during the day, your eyes usually focus on color vision because you have lots of daylight, so you can see all those colors. But oftentimes, if you're an animal who's hunting a lot at night, you need to focus on night vision. And you can't have too many of both. You need kind of one kind of vision or the other. Lots of color vision or lots of really good nighttime vision. So usually it's a little bit of a trade-off, but some owls can still see some colors. So they're able to kind of do a little bit of a trade-off where they can still do a little bit of both. See really well at night, but still see some colors during the daytime. Owls cannot roll or turn their eyeballs in their eye sockets like humans can because their eyes are tube-shaped instead of ball-shaped. To follow prey, an owl must turn its head or raise or lower it, but this is no problem for an owl. Though short, their necks are extraordinarily flexible. Owls have 14 neck vertebrae, seven more than many birds, and seven more than us, I will add. These extra vertebrae allow an owl to swivel its head like a radar scanner, 180 degrees to the right or left, so that the head sometimes appears to be on backwards. An owl can also turn its face completely upside down or flip it back so that its crown or kind of top of its head touches its shoulders. Owls have extra sensitive ears. Their hearing is probably among the best in the animal world. Some species depend more on hearing their prey than on seeing it. A great gray owl can hear a beetle running through grass a hundred feet away or the squeak of a mouse a half mile distant. Most owls' external ears are large slits hidden beneath their facial disc. The facial discs are made of long, soft-edged feathers fastened into the rims of the ear slits. Though the facial discs are what make owls look like owls, their main function is to, ask, is to act as dish antennae. They trap sounds, concentrate them, and funnel them into the ear. An owl can turn or move its facial discs to improve the reception. So they kind of act like if you actually kind of take your hand and kind of put it behind your ears. It works best if you do two at once, but I'm holding the book in one hand. But if you kind of cup your ears, if you kind of cup your ears like this, it kind of funnels sound into them. If you do it on both sides, it makes everything sound louder. So even though the volume on this video stays the same, if you do this on both sides, it'll actually, you can adjust which kind of angle they're at, just like owls can adjust their facial discs and help to funnel sound into your ears and make it sound louder. The eyes of a great gray owl are smaller than those of most owls, but the facial discs are enormous and these birds have remarkable hearing. Great gray owls can locate and capture live prey deep beneath snow or even underground by sound alone. Like most owls, a great gray will sit patiently on a tree branch all night if necessary, cocking its head from side to side and listening intently. An observer once saw a great gray suddenly and silently drop from its roost and hover momentarily over a gopher's burrow. Then, reaching down with its legs, the owl crashed through the feeding tunnel, grasped the unseen animal in its talons, and returned to its branch. The ears of some owls are placed asymmetrically. One ear is lower than the other and are of different sizes. The right ear hears sound best from below. The left ear hears sound best from above. This adaptation helps the owls to locate prey with astonishing pinpoint accuracy. Studies show that a blindfolded owl can fly directly to prey that it cannot see and grasp it in its talons. The slightest movement or sound will alert an owl to get into position to swoop down on its prey. I think we will end there. There's a little bit of this section left, but this book has so much great information. I want to leave plenty of time. So we'll probably revisit this one and pick back up with this page and learning more about owls and owl adaptations in a future week of reading with raptors. So we'll get back to that one. I'll mark this page. 
In the meantime, thank you all again so much for joining us this week. Thank you for indulging me in this training opportunity. Again, we have that schedule conflict on actual Reading with Raptors time. So thank you for joining us for this pre-recorded version. We'll be back live next week. Again, if you do have any questions, though, feel free to put them in the comments. We'll definitely be keeping an eye on those and answer those as well. Again, this has been our resident barn owl, who we call Strix. You may have recognized the name as we were talking through some of those scientific names, a personal favorite subject of mine. But that Strix name comes from the genus of owls, the typical wood owls that this bird comes from. Actually, one of their closer relatives is actually the great gray owl, along with the spotted owl, or some of the other kind of Strix owls that live here in North America. So you might recognize the kind of large, round facial disc shape, the kind of grayer and white kind of camouflage style, kind of longer legs with some kind of nice feathers over the top. So definitely keep an eye out and an ear out for barred owls near you. You can find them across most of the United States and Canada, so here in North America, generally more on the eastern half of the continent, but they've actually expanded their range out to kind of across southern Canada, the northern U.S., and starting to come down along the west coast, especially in that kind of temperate rainforest area in kind of Washington and Oregon. So they're actually expanding their range over time since they have adapted fairly well to this kind of suburban uh, metro area. So they actually have adapted fairly well to living close by people, whereas some other owls have not and really rely more on kind of really heavily wooded areas. So it's been very interesting to see their range changing over the last few decades. Before we sign off, I want to make sure that she gets something really, really good. So I actually have a whole, whole dead mouse here for this owl. So we'll let her finish off that as we kind of wrap up here. But I do want to, again, thank you all very much for letting me use this as an opportunity for training this bird to kind of be in front of a video camera, seeing a book being read. Hopefully she'll finish swallowing that mouse here. So she's working on swallowing it head first down the hatch. Still kind of working on getting it all in place and getting it down. Oh no. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't fit quite right and they have to kind of get it back out and try it again, which is always really fun. Kind of slimy looking though. So that is a barred owl swallowing, still working on it, a whole dead mouse to wrap us up. As always, if you're interested in learning more about the Raptor Center, keep following us here on our Facebook page, or you can check us out at theraptorcenter.org. As always, if you're interested in learning more about having more kind of up close and personal views of a lot of the birds and seeing what other educational programs we have here online, check out that website or we'll post a link to our uh, Sponsor a Raptor program as well. Otherwise, everyone, we will see you all again in a week. Thank you so much for joining us for Reading with Raptors and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Uh, uh.